Uh, so good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd firstly like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. Uh, I work in the group of Professor Stefan Rotter in the Institute for Theoretical Physics at TU Wien. And today I'm going to present some of our latest works, work on non-classical light in uh, mesoscopic spin ensembles. I'd also like to take an opportunity to give an overview of the mathematical work that's the frameworks that we use in our group uh, over the last few years. And that will also give me an opportunity to motivate how we arrived at this point. So before I start, let me just take a step back and start from the first few studies that initiated the field of uh, QED and up to cavity QED. So from the perspective of quantum optics, the first thing that's of importance is the interaction between atom and light. And in this context, one of the first work that was important was if you have an excited atom, how does that atom decay? And this was first shown by Weisskopf and Wigner, who said that the interaction of the atom with the vacuum modes of the electromagnetic field give rise to spontaneous emission. And the spectrum was basically a Lorentzian distribution centered about the transition frequency of the atom with a lamp shift. Interestingly, what followed next was the knowledge that by engineering the vacuum of the electromagnetic field, you could also change the rate of spontaneous emission. And it was Purcell in the 1940s who first showed that if you place an atom in a resident cavity, then you can enhance the rate of spontaneous emission. But atom in a, uh, in a cavity leads to many other interesting features. Primarily, if you have an atom which is coupled to a single mode cavity, you get what are known as the vacuum Rabbi oscillations. And this, this was the first instance where you could show there could be coherent transfer of energy between an atom and a cavity. And so we can think of it in terms of uh, two coupled harmonic oscillators where there is a back forth of energy between the two oscillators. And this, in some sense, gave rise to the idea of the strong coupling regime where you could really have this. And this, in some sense, was the precursor to all of cavity QED we do at the moment. So from Jane's coming model to Rabe oscillations, the first instance of this was experimentally shown in Rydberg atoms by Harosh. And this was the first time where he put placed a, a Rydberg atom in a high Q cavity and actually experimentally demonstrated the Rabe oscillations. And this, in turn, started the entire field of cavity QED. Now, right from the beginning, one of the main questions while studying cavity QED was how well you can trap an atom. And this has led to significant advances in experimental physics. So this is an experiment where you have a Rydberg atom uh, inside a nano cavity, uh, a photonic crust, uh, crystal nano cavity. And this is, I think, a work in which even one of the organizers Johannes Feist was also involved in this experiment. The second instance is of a, again, a rubidium, uh, sorry, a Rydberg atom in a so-called whispering gallery mode of a bottle microresonator. But still, the question remains that trapping atoms inside these cavities still remains a difficult task. And as such, the next step was to try to realize the strong coupling regime in the so-called artificial atoms. So in this case, you have a quantum dot system in a photonic crystal nanocavity. And in the second case, these are optomechanical resonators coupled to high quality uh, optical cavities. And the third, and the one which is uh, quite famous nowadays and is leading the race for implementation of quantum technology is superconducting circuits. <coughs> where you can implement superconducting qubits, as well as resonators. So, so this was the first instances where experimentally strong coupling limits were being uh, done. So in our group, we basically work 
on developing mathematical frameworks, and mathematical frameworks that range from single atoms inside a cavity to ensembles of spins inside a cavity, and we try to look at the interesting phenomena that comes out of it. And today my talk is basically going to talk about uh, generation of pulses of light. And as such, I'll try to uh, show you that periodic pulse generation of light is something that takes place in the multimode strong coupling regime. And so let's begin with. So this is the first instance, uh, first uh, thing I'll talk about is an atom in a multimode cavity. So these are generic descriptions. So the description is basically an extension of the James Cumming Hamiltonian. And you can see here now that the atom here is now coupled to uh, a multimode cavity. So this cavity is basically extends of uh, different modes. So here the summation need not, it need not be a summation, it can also be a continuous distribution of modes. And this Hamiltonian is generic in the sense that you can apply it to traditional real atoms inside a quantum cavity, or you can equally apply it to a superconducting circuit where you have a superconducting qubit right here and the electric field which moves through the superconducting resonator. Okay, so this was one of the first theoretical works that was done for an atom in a multimode cavity. And if you start with the situation where the atom is in, in an excited state, the amplitude of the excited state can be given in the form of a Volterra equation where f dot omega here is the spectral function, which basically gives you the local density of photonic states in the system. And the, this can be then re, the solution of this can then be represented in this form, where u omega is the kernel function, which basically peaks at frequencies where you have the resident condition, which is given by this. So the Fourier transform of this equation would basically give you the solution to the amplitude for the excited state. So if you look at this resonant condition, so if these are your uh, the lamp shift, and your eta here is the, uh, your, sorry, your xi here is the coupling strength. So you can see by varying the coupling strength, you can actually vary the resonant condition in the system. So you can have instance where this, there is just a single frequency. Here you can have two frequencies or you can have uh, multi, multiple frequencies. And I'll show you how each of these would lead to different kind of coupling regimes in the system. So if you have a, if you just have a single uh, intersection here, then your kernel function just as a single peak like this. And what you get is the normal spontaneous decay of the atom. And so this can be seen as this. So in this graph, you can see that it just decays. As you increase the coupling strength, you reach this regime where there are two intersections now. So the, actually, there are three, but these are two are the dominant ones. And this would give you two peaks in your kernel function. And as you can guess, this would then give you the well-known Rabi oscillations. And this you can see would give you this periodic <coughs> revivals in here. And so this is with the damping. And this gives you the Rabi oscillations. Now the third regime is when you can change your coupling in such a way that it has multiple interactions with the lamp shift. <coughs> and in that case, your kernel function now has multiple peaks or residences where the interaction, where the coupling is taking place. And this gives rise to what we call the multimode strong coupling regime. And in this regime, you can see that the, you basically get pulsed revivals of the system. And this period here, sorry, and this period here is nothing but the length of this resonator. So if you view it at this, you'll have this periodic excitations that come in, that take place in the atom that periodic thing. And this is, in some sense, uh, similar to a mod mode locking in which you can think that the energy from the atom is actually distributed over the different modes of the 
cavity and then they move along the length of the cavity and they come together at the center at the same time giving rise to this pulp revi pulse revivals. But so this was the regime of <coughs> multimode strong coupling when you have an atom inside a multimode cavity. The next, the interesting thing here is, okay, sorry, the interesting here is you can get this pulse revivals, but the question now here is, it can still be extremely difficult to have an atom inside a cavity and to maintain this atom in an excited state. Also, if you really want it to couple to so many cavities, you need a cavity of extremely long length so that it can capture so many different frequencies. So you can turn the question on its head. Instead of having a multimode cavity, can you have a situation where you have inserted multiple atoms in the system and inside a single mode cavity? So the question is, can you still reach this strong coupling limit when you have many atoms inside just a single mode cavity? And that is what we look at. And in that sense, <coughs> we go to the regime, we go to systems which are the hybrid quantum systems, which are basically spin ensembles in inside a quantum cavity. And so I'll just discuss a few of the models which are being worked on. So this is the, I think, Ebrium spins, so rare earth elements uh, in a microwave resonator. And these are ultra cold atoms. Similarly, you can have uh, YIG spheres, which are uh, yttrium iron garnet spheres, and which give rise to magnet modes inside, again, a microwave resonator. Or you can have ensembles of superconducting qubits, which interact with the superconducting resonator. The system we would talk about now is the NV centers. So this is one of the uh, hybrid quantum system that's being worked in Vienna, in the Schmidmeier and the Hans Meyer group. And I'll discuss this in particular because a lot of the theoretical work that was done in our group were again experimentally observed in this system. So NV centers are basically you have this uh, diamond. With diamond, you have this, uh, are doped with nitrogen, and they are paired with a vacancy in the system, which, give, which then give rise to this qubit. And then you can place this on top of a line resonator, where you have this huge number of spins, or qubits, or two-level systems on top of the resonator. And this is what allows you to reach a collective strong coupling regime. So each of the spins or NV centers are very weakly coupled to the resonator, but just considering the sheer number of spins that you have in the system, there is an increase and which allows you to reach the strong coupling limit. And this was, you can see, so like the demonstration of how you can reach the uh, strong coupling regime is shown by this anti-crossing out here. And so this is the, theor uh, the theoretical model just for two resonators which are coupled to each other. And you can see that you have this avoided crossing, which is a distinct sign of the strong coupling regime. Similarly, you can also look at the two polaritonic peaks that appear in the system with a Rabe separated by the Rabe frequency. And this is also the clear indicator that you can reach the strong coupling regime using nitrogen vacancy centers. So one of the important points working with spin ensembles in a quantum cavity is inhomogeneous broadening of the spins. And this has detrimental effects on the system. In principle, like most of the work on spin ensembles where you want to design quantum memories or other quantum protocols, one of the main things that you want to look at is how you can avoid the detrimental effects of inhomogeneous broadening. So OK, sorry. So first, maybe I'll just explain the Hamiltonian, which describes the system. and. So in this system, OK, so the, this is the generalized form of the James Cumming Hamiltonian that describes the uh, spin ensembles in a cavity. So this is the Tavis Cumming Hamiltonian. And you can see like omega k represents each two-level system. And gk is the coupling of each two-level system with the single mode cavity. And as done during the case of where you have a single atom in a multi-mode cavity, even in this case, you can apply the Volterra equation 
to solve for the cavity amplitude. So in the first case, we were using the Volterra equation to solve for the excited atom. And your kernel function was nothing but the density of optic photonic states. In this case, your kernel function represents the distribution of the atoms inside the cavity. Using this, now we want to study what the effects of inhomogeneous broadening could be. So in, in particular, inhomogeneous broadening in the spin ensemble can lead to decoherence in the system, which looks something like this. So in particular, if this is the distribution of your, if, if this is the distribution of the spins inside your uh, cavity, and these are your polaritonic peaks, so you can see that the contribution to the decoherence comes from these two points. One way how you can overcome the decoherence due to inhomogeneous broadening is the so-called cavity protection effect. In cavity protection effect, what you do is you increase the coupling of your system such that these peaks correspond to omega where the density is very low. So, so since the density here is extremely low, your overall rate of decoherence actually goes down. The alternate way is what is known as the spectral hole burning. In spectral hole burning, instead of increasing omega to go further away from your polaritonic peaks, you simply burn two holes at this region and remove the rho omega at that point. And if you do that, you can see that the decoherence that you had before hole burning can actually be overcome. So I presented this just to simply say that you can have this Volterra integral form formulation which can study your strong coupling regime and it can allow you to completely describe the system very well. So it applies to two different situations of multimode strong coupling. One is the case where you have an atom inside a multimode cavity. In the other case, you have many atoms inside a single mode cavity. OK, so now back to the multimode strong coupling. Now I want to see that whether I can also get pulse revival in this regime. So in this regime, to get the pulse revival, what I first do is I distribute my atoms in this spectral comb, in atomic frequency comb. <coughs> And you can see like the atoms are distributed around a central frequency uh, around this seven peaks. So these are not just single atoms at this point. These are seven sub-ensembles of atom. And this can, be <coughs> sorry, this can be visualized in nitrogen vacancy centers by placing uh, a number of nitrogen, nitrogen vacancy centers like this. So each one is an ensemble of atoms with different orientations such that their coupling to the field is, to the cavity is different. So we basically have a spectral comb like this. And in this case, you can see that you can again get the periodic pulse generation. So this is the regime where you, this is the strong coupling regime where you just have something similar to the rabbi oscillations. And this is the multimode strong coupling regime where you have this periodic pulse generation. Okay, and <clears throat> this is not simply a theoretical framework. So there was this uh, experiment done in Yale where they used this uh, yttrium ion garnet spheres to create a s similar frequency comb. And their main interest was to study this so-called gradient memory effect. So if you store an information in the, in the cavity, and you want it to revive after a particular, after a fixed period of time. So it's like having an information stored in the cavity and in the form of a pulse, it is generated after a fixed amount of time. <clears throat> and atomic frequency combs have also been studied outside the context of cavity QED. You can simply have an, uh, a spin ensemble which is interacting with an electromagnetic field. And you can have a frequency comb, and you can still have multimode quantum memory effects in those things. And the idea is somewhat similar. You basically have pulse revivals after fixed periods of time. OK. <clears throat> so 
these were the two cases these were the two cases that we looked at and in both cases i was able to show you that we get pulse generation of light so first instance was a single atom multimode and then spin ensemble in a cavity and in both cases we get this pulse revival in the multimode strong coupling but the question that we want to ask is from the perspective of quantum information protocols and quantum other quantum memory and other uh, technological aspects can we generate pulse revivals of light which are actually non classical so so far we are working in the semi classical domain where like the cavity can in principle always be treated classically and you can use traditional maxwell blocks equations or other semi classical approximations like the voltaire integrals to solve the system but now we want to see if you can have such periodic pulses in like to generate non classical pulses of light now in this case there is a major roadblock in some sense because you clearly define two different limits so one is the macroscopic ensemble where you have a large number of atoms and the other is the few spin systems where you have single atom in a single cavity in that limit now macroscopic ensembles give you the strong coupling regime they give you the collective behavior they are the cases where you have this multiple modes moving around which can generate pulse revival and things like that but in few spin systems you don't get the collective effect but instant you get the enharmonicity of the energy levels and this is the interesting thing that leads to effects like single photon generation and things like that where you can truly generate non classical light theoretically speaking in macroscopic ensembles you can immediately go to the thermodynamic limit you can say the spin cavity is uncorrelated you can use semi classical solutions but in the microscopic limit you need to solve the quantum regime exactly you need to solve for the atom as well as the cavity and look at the correlations that develop between them and in principle if you want to solve the open system for few spin systems you basically need to know how to solve the lindblad equations <coughs> so if you want to generate pulsed light uh, pulse revival of light but in the context of non classical light we have to go somewhere in between we have to go to a particular regime that has enough spins to show some collective effect but small enough to retain the non classicality and not go to the semi classical limit and this is the point that we are going to look at now so once again for solving the mesoscopic spin cavity system we come back to the tavis cummings hamiltonian where again you have a finite number of a small number of emitters which are inside a quantum cavity and then you can drive the cavity with some periodic with some external field and the true solutions for this system would be given by the lindblad equation which would define your open dynamics of this entire system so but the main constraint in this case is the hilbert space would immediately start increasing as you increase the number of spins so once you go beyond one or two or three spins you cannot have any exact solutions of the quantum regime so this is one of the main points that we want to attack now there have been several novel, novel approaches to solve this lindbladian going to different limits so one approach is using effective hamiltonians so in this case you basically uh, assume that the system is very weakly excited you ignore quantum jumps in the system and you try to write a effective non hamiltonian hamiltonian that can describe sorry that can describe the dynamics of the system <clears throat> second you have quantum jump or monte carlo or quantum trajectories method in this thing you basically break the lindblad equation into a set of uh, a set of unitary dynamics not unitary exactly so what you basically do is you write an effective hamiltonian in this way 
and the quantum jumps are stochastically introduced into the system. So you have many quantum dynamics which are, which are solved and at each step you can arbitrarily put a quantum jump to capture the Lindblad dynamics completely. And there are several works that use this quantum jump or trajectories method to solve Lindblad equations. The third is using a matrix product state. In this case, you instead of solving the Lindblad equation, you try to solve the Hamiltonian for a larger system, which includes parts of your uh, environment, and you try to study the unitary dynamics of this larger Hilbert space. Then you have methods which are based on cumulants and also on other semi-classical equations. So these methods basically try to see if you just use semi-classical equations, how close can you go to the quantum regime? And third is like by using permutation symmetry, as Professor Keeling discussed in the morning. So using permutation symmetry, you can also go to a fairly large number of spins, provided all the spins are identical. So these are some methods that have been used to attack mesoscopic system. But while they work perfectly well and give very good results in specific regimes, they have certain assumptions put in somewhere. Like for instance, you can only use effective Hamiltonians if your system is very weakly excited. So it's more or less in the ground state so that you can completely neglect quantum jumps. In quantum trajectories, you need to exactly solve it at the level of unitary dynamics. So in that case, you are still limited to a finite number of spins. Even in the MPS, since you solve for a larger Hilbert space, you are only limited to few spins. And in permutation symmetry and methods based on semi-classical equations, you are limited only to identical spins. As soon as you have inhomogeneous broadening in the system, these methods will not give you accurate results, or it cannot be implemented. So our approach was to develop a variational renormalization group method. And this variational renormalization group, like tensor network methods, and we wanted to apply it directly to solve the Lindblad equation. So I'll just give you a very, very uh, small overview. So the basic idea of variation renormalization group method is, if your system is described in a large Hilbert space, but the overall system is extremely weakly entangled, then the entire system can be renormalized or truncated to a very small space. And this you basically do by provoking the entanglement between different parts of the system and you use singular value decompositions to represent it in represent it in a smaller Hilbert space. So this is the basic idea in density matrix renormalization group, matrix product states, or any other tensor network method. A similar idea can also be now extended to density operators to study open dynamics of the system. Now instead of the Hilbert space of the quantum state, you have a large super operator space that defines the density matrix. And this density matrix, if it's weakly correlated, can also be represented in a much smaller, smaller operator space. Now there's a difference. In the first instance, I'm invoking entanglement to say that it can be represented in a smaller space. In this case, I'm saying the total correlations of the system must be small so as to allow me to uh, represent it in a much smaller Hilbert space. And this was shown in this PRL in 2004 where this kind of an analogy can in principle exist. Now what do I mean by the super operator space? So what I mean is where my density matrices can be vectorized and my density matrices are now represented as vectors in the complex vector space, and my operators are now super operators in this space. Similarly, the entire Lindblad equation can now be represented in the super operator space, and the entire mechanism of variational renormalization group is now mapped to this much, much larger system. But still the question remains, how would you implement this in spin cavity systems? Because most tensor network methods and most uh, MPS and DMRG techniques are restricted to nearest neighbor sites. So for some, we need to put it, uh, we need to solve this in the context of spin cavity systems which are not 
as you all know, nearest neighbor interactions. <coughs> One way to do is, is to look at how variation renormalization methods are applied in quantum dots, where you have a quantum dot interacting with nuclear spins. And in this case, you have methods known as cluster DMRG. But once more, I would like to stress that these are only doable if the system is in unitary dynamics. And you can use cluster DMRG methods. So how does this map to the spin cavity system? Because you can also map a spin cavity system this way. So you can consider the cavity to be your central body and with all the spins in your system to be like the, uh, a bath of quantum objects surrounding the cavity. And in this case, you can then solve the Lindblad dynamics, which is now represented in the super operator space. OK, so now back to multimode strong coupling. So I would just uh, capture what I have said so far. So what I wanted to say is I want to access the multimode strong coupling limit to generate pulsed revival of light. In the first instance, I showed how you can have an atom in a multimode cavity. And the multimode cavity, can you can reach the multimode strong coupling limit, which would give you pulsed revival of classical light. Second, it's difficult to implement <coughs> atom in a multimode cavity. So we go to a spin ensemble inside a cavity. And in spin ensemble inside a cavity, we can again generate pulse revival of light. But once again, these are classical light. So I'm now in the mesoscopic regime. And again, I define a spectral frequency goal. But now, in each of these points, I don't have huge ensembles, but I have, say, few spins. So even though I have few, few spins, I can scale it up to, say, 100 spins. So in some sense, I have some collective feature. But since I'm not in the 10 to the power 12 or 10 to the power uh, 14 regime or higher regime, I can also access the non-classical features. Now, to stress the importance of the method, you already see that this system is not homogeneous. Since it's in a spectral frequency comb, it has an inbuilt inhomogeneity in the system. So it can be scaled to a very large number of spins, and it can be excited. So this system could, couldn't have been solved using any of the known methods so far. So it was important to derive this renormalization group to solve it. And so this is the pulse revival that we now get. So this is the cavity photon number, and this is the spin excitation. So you can see we have, uh, we have all the spins in the ground state initially, and the cavity is unexcited. And we excite the cavity with a very short pulse. And then we switch it off. And then the cavity shows this periodic pulses of light. <clears throat> this is, again, completely collective feature due to the, large, due to the number of spins in the system. And you so OK, this is the collective property. And you can see that there is a distinct mesoscopic effect here. You can see, so if red is for 105 spins, and uh, the blue lines are for seven spins, you can see if I put, plot the cavity photon number in the log scale, the 105 spins are much more stable. Like the periodic pulses for 105 spins are much more stable compared to seven spins. <coughs> And this last slide shows how there is the coherent exchange of energy between the cavity and the spins. So when you have the pulses, it's all the spins in the cavity lose their energy, and vice versa. And importantly, the periodicity of this pulse is directly proportional to the spectral width of the system. So by changing the spectral width or, or engineering it in your lab, you can actually control the Period, period of your revival. And now the interesting part, now this is the G2 function which calculates the second order correlation function of the light. And you can see that the G2 function is less than one. So the light is essentially sub-Poisonian and it's non-classical. So you can see that there is distinct sub-Poisonian statistics. So the light that's coming out at each period, so this is for a different time scale. So you can see that the light that comes out at each of these 
revival pulse is essentially non-classical light. And you can see that the light is not only subpoisonian, this can actually have very low values of the second correlation function. So second correlation function basically says what's the probability have of having two photon processes as compared to single photon processes. So these are basically saying that at this regime, your light is basically just a single photon process. So to reiterate once more, so this regime where the G2 function is above half is basically just your subpoison in light because your G2 is less than one. So in this case, what I've done is I've just pointed the lowest points in the G2 function instead of plotting the entire thing. And this is your unambiguous single photon regime where your G2 minimum is actually less than half. And if you plot the higher photon processes, so if you plot the G2, G3, and the G4 functions, which relate to three photon, four photon processes, you see that all of them actually tend to zero. So this, in some sense, gives you a true criteria for the single photon source. So if you have the spectral comb and you have the pulse revivals, after some evolution time, the pulse that you'll be get, getting would actually just be limited to single photon processes. So in th some sense, we are able to get a non-classical pulse strain of light using the spectral comb. OK. So to summarize, so we first started with this regime. This was the multimode strong coupling regime, where we just had a single atom in a multimode cavity. And we had pulsed excitations, which was a multimode effect. And to solve this, we used Volterra integrals. This is a semi-classical method. And it gave us this. So we wanted to, st we wanted to stay in the multimode regime. We wanted to get a system which was more efficient than this setup, but would still give us multimode strong coupling. So we went over to spin ensembles in a cavity. So in spin ensembles in a cavity, you have the collective strong coupling. You can design an atomic frequency comb. And you can again get classical light pulses, which are pulsed excitation. But this system can again be solved at the level of semi-classical approximations using Volterra integrals. Now the next question we wanted to ask was, can we have light pulses which are now non-classical? And for that, we went to the mesoscopic limit, where you have few spins inside a cavity. You have collective strong coupling again. But for few spins, you again define an atomic frequency comb, and you solve the problem at the quantum regime. And then we use this variational renormalization group method to solve it. And in this case, we were able to get non-classical light pulses. OK. So as an outlook, I would first like to spend some time just to describe the variational renormalization group. So this actually gives us new directions to look at complex dynamics in mesoscopic spin systems. So in particular, Using this method, you can now access systems which are relatively highly excited, that they can have inhomogeneous broadening within them, and they are not limited to certain parameters or certain uh, specific coupling regimes. You can access multimode strong coupling. You can access strong coupling, even weak coupling. You can access the entire plethora, albeit with the limitation that the limitation you have with all tensor network methods, you can't go to a system where the system is highly entangled. So as long as you're in a regime where entanglement and correlations are low, you can access a huge new area of dynamics. Again, secondly, you can look at nonlinear behavior beyond weak excitations. And importantly, it now opens up a large, it opens up a bridge between the larger tensor network community and many body physics community where we can exchange ideas and try to bring back, bring those back to cavity QED systems. From the perspective of non-classical light, the next step is to understand how you can opti optimally control them. Can you have controlled uh, pulses of light that generate a specific kind of non-classical light that you want in your system? So if you have a driving field in which you can engineer or manipulate, you can 
generate different regimes or different intervals or different periods of non-classical light and also single photon sources. And you can also look at phenomena such as unconventional photon blockade and super punching. And these are all phenomena that are now so closely connected to implementation of cavity QED systems uh, in quantum technology. To give you an example, these are some of the systems that are used in, like are likely to be used in quantum cryptography or in linear quantum optical computing models because they rely on these non-classical sources to operate. And also you can now look at fundamental questions, specifically how does systems trans, how do they make transition from the microscopic limit where, it, where the solutions can be completely quantum to the semi-classical thermodynamic limit where you can use uh, Maxwell block equations or other semi-classical uh, mathematical formulations. So this would allow you to know at what number of spins or at what particular limit you can go over to treating your light classically. Okay, to end, the work was mainly, this is the theoretical people who are working on quantum optics in the group of uh, Professor Stefan Rotter. And finally, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for your attention.